हार के जीतने वाले को बाजीगर कहते हैं बट देन जो जीता वही सिकंदर फॉर द नेक्स्ट फाइव ईयर्स द बाजीगर ऑफ इंडियन पॉलिटिक्स विल कीप ट्राइंग टू बिकम द सिकंदर दिस इज अ सिचुएशन दैट मार्केट्स एंड इन्वेस्टर्स इन इंडिया आर ग्रॉसली अनफेमिलियर विथ फॉर द पास्ट डेकेड पोलिटिकल स्टेबिलिटी हैज बीन टेकन एज अ गिवन फॉर इंडिया Uh, there could be a protest here a riot there but the modi government was unshakable that changes now the bjp has lost its majority and its coalition the nda is barely hanging on by a margin of around 20 seats importantly the opposition alliance is less than 40 seats away from the halfway mark and so like piranhas opposition parties will keep trying to snap at the nda to try to destabilize the government this means that india's risk premium that is the extra return that investors expect for their additional risk of investing in india that goes up because of the political uncertainty something that wasn't the case for the past 10 years hello and welcome to the bond economist your one stop destination for professional advice on the economy my name is arudeep nandi and today we discuss in detail how the economy would look like under modi 3.0 light As always if you like this kind of content please do subscribe and uh, if you'd like to support me the super thanks button is below first things first to understand what the priorities of the modi government in the third term is going to be it's really important to understand what went wrong with modi nomics in the previous term at one level you can't really fault prime minister modi his growth model is exactly what most economists would prescribe cut down on freebies spend massively on india's infrastructure give serious state support to help india benefit from the ongoing shift in manufacturing supply chains away from china resolve the bad debt crisis inherited from the upa days reduce regulatory burden on businesses and use digitization and financial inclusion to better deliver public goods and do all of this while keeping inflation fiscal deficit and current account deficit under control they are the blood pressure cholesterol and triglycerides of any economy if you don't control them you will end up on the operating table so what went wrong well in a nutshell a monumental failure of trickle down economics yes india is growing at 7 to 8% one of the fastest rates in the world but this has been driven by four things one in government's massive investment drive two a recovering real estate sector three a stable global economy which means that our exports particularly services exports are performing well and four a massive k in the economy it's k because sitting on top part of the k are better off households larger companies urban consumers who are doing quite well the pandemic didn't hurt them much and the post pandemic boom was working for them you see evidence of this all around you suvs clogging up roads airports packed the nifty doing great five star hotels at full occupancies for the upper half of the k india is shining and shining bright but the bottom part of the k has been living in the shadows this includes rural india the poor MSMEs the massive majority of India's working age population that is either self employed or casually employed or worse just out of the labor force for the average graduate from some unknown university in the hinterlands of India 7% growth is a meaningless statistic that graduate is not even trying for private sector jobs where supposedly the government believes that jobs are being generated because of all the these reforms instead he is like कुछ नहीं तो सही सरकारी नौकरी ही दिला दो एंड सो इन व्हाट रिमेन्स अ शेमफुल रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ हाउ आर एजुकेशन सिस्टम एंड जॉब मार्केट्स हैव फेल्ड आर यूथ लैक्स ऑफ ग्रेजुएट्स एंड मास्टर्स एंड पीएचडी स्टूडेंट्स रूटीनली लाइन अप फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू बिकम ग्लोरिफाइड पियोन्स क्लर्क्स एंड कॉन्स्टेबल्स इन द गवर्नमेंट एंड इवन दोज हु मैनेज टू गेट अ हेड ऑफ द लैक्स ऑफ एस्पिरेंट्स वाइंग फॉर दीज जॉब्स दे क्रैक दीज एग्जाम्स and suddenly find themselves stuck in the patal lok of papers being leaked results being challenged in the courts and their appointment letters put on hold sometimes for years and the government hasn't really been very good at listening to these warning signs 
Remember how uh, whenever ministers used to be asked about the employment situation or inconsistencies in the GDP data or issues around uh, household finances, they would routinely deflect the question, talk about some other data point and basically outright deny that anything was remotely wrong. But things were going wrong. Be it farmers in Delhi protesting for more concessions or farmers in Maharashtra protesting against arbitrary bans on uh, onion exports or youth in UP and Bihar protesting against the Agnivir scheme that limits the term of uh, a majority of the new entrants in the armed forces to only four years. The common factor linking all these protests was that most of the public was just disillusioned with how much money they were making versus how much things have become expensive. The BJP manifesto pretended as if there are no problems. It looked like a long self-congratulatory advert on what a great job it believes it has done. But pretending that a problem doesn't exist doesn't make it go away. So sure, Modi wins the personality contest hands down in Indian politics. But as this election showed, personality isn't always enough when people are dissatisfied. So what does this mean for Modinomics 3.0? First, let's talk politics. BJP's two major lifelines at this point are Andhra Pradesh's TDP with 16 seats and Bihar's JDU with 12 seats. Given that the NDA is only 21 seats or so above the majority mark, these two parties have become the de facto Jamai Rajas of the NDA. And this impacts the governance of the new government in two very important ways. First, the Prime Minister can no longer be a CEO. The cabinet won't be filled just with political lightweights from within the party, where his wish becomes the minister's command and the bureaucracy just snaps their heels and gets to work. Instead, he will be dealing with seasoned politicians from his allies. So the relationship between the Prime Minister and some of his ministers is likely to undergo a shift which could possibly impact the way decision-making is done. Second, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar are likely to come at the front and centre of national politics and national economics. Both states have suffered bad divorces, Andhra Pradesh giving way to Telangana and Bihar giving way to Jharkhand. In both cases, the states have long complained that they haven't been given enough support by the centre. So what would be the economic impact of this? Well, there are two things that the markets are focusing on. One, what happens to the fiscal situation and two, what happens to reforms. Let's look at these one by one. On the fiscal side, as we have flagged on this channel many times before, the last decade has seen spectacular discipline by the government on fiscal deficit. That is, broadly speaking, the difference between government expenditure and government revenues. Even during the pandemic, the government was very conservative in terms of extra spending. And since then, the fiscal deficit has been brought down from over 9% of GDP during the pandemic to 5.1% of GDP aimed in this year and less than 4.5% of GDP by next year. And this has helped stabilize our national debt at a time when other countries have been struggling. Now, the question is, Will the government be able to maintain this level of discipline in the coming future? Now, there are broadly two points of view in the market. One set of people believe that there's no need to worry. 5.1% of GDP fiscal deficit this year is at little risk of breach. As we had covered, again in a previous episode of The Bond Economist, uh, the RBI has sent excess dividends to the government this year to the tune of around 0.4% of GDP. Secondly, uh, the government has already saved around 0.2% of GDP on its fiscal deficit last year. Its target was 5.8% of GDP, but it finally turned out to be only 5.6% of GDP. So the government has some amount of fiscal cushion. And third, one of the key global rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, recently put India on the fast track to a rating upgrade as long as they are convinced that India manages to keep its fiscal deficit over the years under control. And other rating agencies will also not want to upgrade India until they know that coalition politics will not cause deficit to blow up. And the government recognizes 
that there will be a hit to India's macro stability if fiscal deficit spirals out of control. So one point of view is that regardless of anything, the government will continue to bring deficit down every year as it had planned. But given coalition politics, it may reduce the quantum by which um, the fiscal deficit is reduced every year. The other school of thought believes that the age of fiscal discipline is probably over. Both Andhra Pradesh and Bihar are in deep fiscal shit. After the divorce, Andhra Pradesh lost the thriving city of Hyderabad, the main revenue generator. And on the other hand, despite um, losing Hyderabad, successive state governments in Andhra Pradesh have indulged in unchecked populism. So on one side, you aren't making enough money. And on the other side, you are spending like there's no tomorrow. Add to this the confusion around the capital of the state. When the TDP was in power in the state originally, the then Chief Minister Chandrababu Naidu had poured in considerable resources into making Amravati the state capital to replace Hyderabad. But when he lost the state elections, his rival YSRCP junked the project and made Amravati one of the three state capitals, effectively condemning all the half-finished buildings and infrastructure in the city into ghost projects. Now that the TDP is back in power in the state, the old new chief minister Chandrababu Naidu wants to rebuild his lost city of Amravati. Except now he is inheriting a fiscal deficit of over 4% of the state's GDP, where healthy levels would be around 3%. And this deficit is adding to a debt burden of around 33% of GDP. I mean, for a healthy state, the debt should be less than 20%. And guess what? Despite these really alarming fiscal numbers, TDP in the elections had announced a raft of populist measures like 4,000 rupees uh, monthly pension for the elderly, 3,000 rupees per month of unemployment allowance, free bus travel for women, 4 lakh jobs per year, 3 uh, free gas cylinders per year, 20,000 rupees assistance for farmers annually. Uh, they're calling this the super six guarantee. So where will money for all of this come from? Bihar, by the way, is in a worse situation. Bihar's debt is even higher than Andhra Pradesh's 33% of GDP. Bihar is at 37% of GDP. Its fiscal deficit is nearly double at close to 9% of GDP, one of the highest in the country. And Bihar's own tax revenues account for only a small part of its overall revenue. So it relies primarily on central government's transfers. I mean, most of us have this sense of nationalistic pride that look, our country is so different from neighbours like Pakistan or Sri Lanka that are on the brink of bankruptcy. But if hypothetically some of our states didn't have the backing of the central government, the way they have mismanaged their finances, they would be in very similar situations. So a key demand of these states is going to be uh, something called a special status which basically at one point of time used to be given to weaker states or states with geographical challenges where they get more support on centrally sponsored schemes, some concessions on how they get to spend their money and some tax breaks. Now, the 14 Finance Commission did away with this practice and instead said that, okay, let us increase the share of taxes of states, uh, what states get from center from 32% to 42%. So you are getting more money as it is, no need to make anyone else special. And the central government has used this as an excuse of so far not entertaining the demands of Andhra Pradesh and Bihar. But now the center is forced to pay attention. And look, regardless of whether they get this special status or not, most news reports seem to suggest that more money will flow now from New Delhi to Andhra Pradesh and Bihar who could also possibly eat into the resources shared with other states. There are already reports that the government is considering a 1 lakh crore package for Bihar. By the way, 1 lakh crore is around 0.3% of GDP. Let's say Andhra Pradesh also gets something similar. So put together around 0.6% of GDP in total. Remember, fiscal deficit for FI25 was targeted at 5.1% of GDP. So 0.6% of GDP is not a small amount. And by the way, other states could also complain of partiality if this happens, saying that, Are, 
मुझे भी चाहिए स्पेशल स्टेटस गिव मी एक्स्ट्रा फंड्स फॉर माई प्रोजेक्ट्स ऑल्सो एंड लेस वी फर्गेट बी जे पी इट सेल्फ फॉर पोलिटिकल रीजन्स मे बी इनक्लाइंड टू बिकम मोर पॉपुलिस्ट इट मे इंक्रीज द आउटले ऑफ सम मिनिस्ट्रीज इट मे चूज टू डायल्यूट स्कीम्स लाइक से अग्निवीर which was designed to bring down the pension bill of our armed forces by limiting the number of years that new entrants get to serve so the contrarian point of view in the market is that the golden era of fiscal discipline just got over which point of view will be proven right will be understood in the final budget for fy25 that the new government will present uh, most likely in july where we'll get to know if they intend to stick to the 5.1% of gdp target and in the weeks leading to it when news reports may give us some insights on what the parties are bargaining for that said what happens to the reform agenda under this new government so here's the thing in india most reforms have largely been politics proof so far there has generally been unanimous acceptance that you need more foreign investments you need to reduce regulatory burden uh, you have to encourage uh, digitization uh, invest more in infrastructure in renewable energy to work towards energy security you need to make the bureaucracy work better uh, simplify taxation uh, these are largely non controversial and some of them administrative reforms and will most likely keep happening in the background away from the media and public glare but the tougher reforms say around land labor or agriculture just got tougher take land for example the modi government tried tackling it in the first term so the previous upa government had come up with a land acquisition bill that made it really difficult um, costly and cumbersome for companies to acquire land so the modi government brought in this ordinance that exempted some important categories of projects uh, like national security rural infrastructure affordable housing industrial corridors etc from some of those stringent regulations clauses around land use uh, consent and the need to do social impact assessments but the opposition was so strong that the government had to effectively roll these back by the way it's not like industries are not acquiring land it's just that interested state governments have found ways to work around these stringent regulations same is the case for labor reforms the modi government took over 40 various central labor laws and decluttered them into four codes for companies and in the process they sharpened some of the laws new social security measures regulations around strikes allowing manufacturing units up to 300 workers to hire and fire without uh, government approval the codes are ready from the legislative side but they haven't yet been notified the government is facing a lot of heat from trade unions and some of the states are holding out so the reforms are essentially in limbo again the more enterprising state governments that really want manufacturing to flourish in their states are finding ways around these laws so at a national level on the one side we want india to be this manufacturing powerhouse we want to uh, bring manufacturing away from china to india and yet our laws around the basic inputs of manufacturing things like land and labor date back decades and seem to be uh, more designed to scare away companies so these reforms the hard ones will probably be difficult for the nda to do in its current avatar because modi 3.0 won't be able to politically survive uh, mass protests like the farmer agitation the way modi 2.0 could do so what does this all mean for growth well the good news is that india's growth can't be so easily shaken by uh, a dozen seats here or there Yes the absence of the revolutionary reforms around land labor or agriculture means that india may struggle to reach its full potential but we have a young entrepreneurial population our corporates and banks have managed to clean up their balance sheets the government is likely to continue spending a sizable proportion of its budget uh, every year on rapid development of infrastructure global growth remains stable um i mean if the situation is right we could finally see private investments that have remained stagnant in the past decade or so to finally pick up and drive stellar levels of growth as was the case in the early 2000s 
interestingly at a time when coalition politics was actually quite similar to the situation this time around. To keep track of where India is headed, like, share and subscribe to The Bond Economist. Mm -hmm.